So I'm here today to talk about V6 deployment, where we're at, what things are going on globally, um, what tools ISPs can use to help them deploy V6. Um, how many people have heard of V6 before? I don't know how much backtracking I got to do here. So how many people have heard about it? Great, wonderful. It's a good, good audience then. So today I'm going to cover current deployments. I'm going to cover this really in two ways. One, ISP deployment. Um, network operators, what they've posted, what kind of statistics we have. I'm also going to cover websites. That's a big one. Content providers, what, what websites are giving out, what kind of information they have. This is the important part, right? Just because network operators get it to your house doesn't mean that they have something to look at. So the, there's, there's two sides of this. We have to get the websites working, and we have to have the network operators bringing V6 to the home. Um, we're also going to talk about networking equipment, and the reason we're going to talk about that is because you deliver it to the house if none of the things in the home work. It's useless. If you've brought this great V6 pipe to the house, but the users can't use it at all because their home router, their TV, their computer don't support V6. So those are the kind of things we're going to talk about. I'm also going to touch on a little bit. I think Dan will probably have some of this too with his ITF update. I'm going to talk a little bit about where V6 is going, some of the new things it's been doing um, from a high-level perspective. All right, so here's the really good news. Google this year posted that their V6 traffic from October of 2012 to October of 2013 doubled. Right? They announced that we had 1% in 2012. Now we're up to 2%. That's really good. It's been doubling almost every year for the last two years. So next year, hopefully 4%, fingers crossed. It, it's going up. We're seeing more content, more stuff out there. The amount of traffic is obviously growing. Um, if you want to look at any of these measurements, I've put the link here. All the measurements I'm going to talk about come from the World V6 launch day. Um, that's been an ongoing thing, basically. We, they launched in June of 2012. Yeah, June of 2012 is when we did it. And since then, more operators, more websites have been uploading their information. So a lot of the statistics I'm using for today come from on that website. If you want to check it out yourself, go. Um, they update pretty regularly. Um, I have snapshots in my presentation that I'm going to talk about today. So um, feel free to go to the website, check it out yourself. Um, this first one I'm going to talk about is network operators. So this is currently what we're looking at for percentages, right? If you go to this website, there's, uh, I want to say, 70-some network operators currently listed. Now, some of these network operators are universities, so not quite a network operator, but they are running a campus and they are deploying V6. Um, if you look at this, we've got some pretty big ISPs. This is the default page I just pulled from it. You can search for ISPs. Um, I tried to search for a couple of Canadian ones I knew, and I didn't see them on here, but go check yourself. Go check it out. Um, these are their deployment rates, so we have the ASNs they have, but also how much they've deployed to the users. So these are users currently using V6. So what that means is that an ISP might deploy V6, but the user might not use it. Right, so this statistic is actually people actually using it is how it's judged. So Comcast, for example, has 8.2%. Verizon Wireless has, as you see, a very high percentage. The reason for that is they have a much tighter control over the, the wireless handsets. So they can turn it on V6 a lot easier than a broadband or wireline ISP. Um, they have a, a very high number. We have some other ones in here, Free Telecom in France, um, Time Warner. These are all global, obviously, and it varies from country to country. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. But um, any operator who is deploying V6, I urge them to go go to ISOC's page and participate in this so that users can see what you're doing, how much you've deployed. Um, these numbers have been going up pretty steadily over the last year. Um, this is just a website traffic showing that basically the top 100 sites reachable over V6 were about 12.5%. Um, these are people actually accessing it over V6, not the number of sites available. So it's a pretty good percentage if you talk to the website content guys. They're pretty They've seen this steadily increase. As you can see, the numbers, they spike. Um, they've been going up as basically when an ISP rolls out V6, their numbers jump every time. So an another good sign for the deployment of V6. Um, all right, so this is the world V6 adoption map. Green is good. Um, white is not so good in the sense that not a whole lot has happened. Red is bad from the perspective of it's been deployed, but there's some issues some latency issues. So red is uh, a bad deployment is how I put it. But white isn't good either. White means that you're not deploying a whole lot, right? So as you see, the US is green. There's some other interesting ones here, Peru, green. Um, Europe has a whole block of countries in there, and I'm going to talk about this more. Um, China is a, a shade of green. Canada is a very slight shade of green at the moment. 
but it's there. Um, Australia's green. We've got some red countries. Japan is red because they deployed V6 a little bit early and they have some um, latency issues. Uh, when they deployed it, they basically have a, a infrastructure walled garden that causes them a little bit of pain, but they've been undoing that over the last couple of years and the latency has been improving um, over the last couple of years. But as you can see, it, it's a, been a slow process for world adoption of V6. It, it's a slow moving. Um, and today I would love to hear some questions as we get further along about what people are stumbling on or what they need help with. Um, so I took Canada's number from there and it's 0.33% of users are using V6 in Canada. I gave you some other countries and their numbers. So Romania, 7.5%. US is 4.2, Peru 4, China 1. Australia is pretty close to you guys, they're 0.4 also. Um, France is 5.4. The real thing here is you know how how can we help Canada get this number up? Because th this number's got to be higher, right? That there's, there's a lot of tech stuff here. This, this number is sort of disappointing. I was kind of surprised when I went to look at this. This is something that um, I'm hoping people in this room will help increase so that next year when someone comes back or if I come back and give this presentation, I can have much, much better numbers to give you guys. Um, yeah, it, it's a little surprising, but that, that is what it is. That's, now, I will say this statistic comes from the Google website and they have a, a metric that they use to get how many users are going to google.com. It's a pretty good litmus test. You, there's a lot of users that go to that. Um, Facebook has slightly different numbers, but if you talk to the Facebook guys, they're pretty close to what Google announces. So I, I pulled these from the Google statistics. If you want to check it out, um, just go to I, Google's IPv6 slash statistics, and that will show you what their stats are. You can click on all the countries and see. They actually explain how they get the, the numbers if you're really that interested in it. So, you know, the, the second question I get when I say, hey, how can I help you deploy V6? A lot of people's problem is, is they don't even know, you know how to tell the equipment they're buying or putting in their network. How do I make sure that it's V6 ready? There's lots of test programs out there. There's the USG test program. That's really for the US government, but you feel free to use it. <laughs> that program lists a lot of RFCs. Go look at the profile. If there are things that are important to you, you can just leverage that. The US government, anyone selling to the US government does that testing, right? So you can actually leverage that and say, did you do US government testing? If your buyer says yes, that means that they're, they're pretty far along in their V6 deployment. Um, there's also the V6 Ready Logo program. That logo program is a global um, program that's used around the world. It basically is a program that allows manufacturers to put a sticker on their equipment to say that they're V6 ready. Um, it takes a lot of the base RFCs and tests it for you. Now, do you still need to do testing on your own when you go to roll out V6? Absolutely, right? But this gets you a low bar. You realize you can put this device in your network or wherever it is you want to, and it probably won't wreck, no, it won't wreck your network from a V6 perspective. Will it do everything you need? Probably not, right? You're gonna wanna do some integration testing. The real thing here is it's base V6, so for applications, you're gonna wanna try them. Right? Don't just assume that your application that worked over V4 will work over V6. There's probably a good chance it won't. Right? You're going to have to do some integration and ask some questions. But um, when you go to look for devices, you know, the US program, the V6 Ready, both of them have lists. Um, I think I have them later in the presentation. You want to go to them. I'll explain a little bit more about these programs. But you want to go to those sites. Look up those. All those, both of those programs have public websites. You can go to them and go see people's networking equipment and see what they have, what people have built. Um, if someone isn't on that list, ask them why they're not. They might have a very good reason, but you, you're going to want to ask your suppliers what they're doing so that when you go to roll V6 out. And I'll say, the stuff you're buying today, you want it to do V6, so when you turn it on, you can just turn it on. Your worst nightmare is something you buy today, and when you go to turn on V6 in eight months or a year or whatever it is, and then you just bought equipment that doesn't do V6 and has no upgrade path, you're in trouble. Right, because now you've got to rebuy something that you just bought. So I urge you to start thinking now about how you're going to buy V6 equipment and starting to work on those lists and asking the people that you're working with. If they don't have V6, they better have a really good roadmap, because at this point, we're pretty far along down the V6 path, and they better have a roadmap for updating. Um, also, World V6 Launch, which I mentioned earlier, they had a website network operator. So the third component of what they had was um, a program for home routers. And the reason they had this is because network during World V6 Day, network providers said, hey, we're bringing V6 to places. People say we're not ready. Our problem is the home gateways don't support V6. So while my infrastructure, my edge infrastructure supports it, the router that the user is buying, whether they go to Best Buy or the ones that we have to supply, our suppliers, don't support V6. So they added a component for home routers. And this is really important in that now home router supported V6. At least right now, to your house, they can go, if you plug directly into your router, 
you know, it's on the World V6 launch list, it'll support V6. It'll get you V6, you can get out to the internet, you can do all those cool things. Um, real quick, the V6 forum, this has been around since 2001, so this is the Ready Logo program. This program is a global program. It's got lots of participants from all over the world, so we work with labs in Japan, China, North America. Um, who am I missing? Oh, Europe. All those different areas, we've worked with labs to create this test program. It's basically so that we're not testing V6 in a thousand different ways in a thousand different places. It's a coordinated program. Everybody's getting the same testing with the same results to um, baseline. Um, the Ready logo covers things we've heard today about you know, security. It covers things, there's logos for IPSEC, Ike V2, um, core testing, DHCP, MLD for multicast. We've just, we're about to launch one for home routers. Um, again, this is something you should be looking for. You should be talking to the people you're buying equipment from and asking them if they have these stickers. Um, currently, there's 800. We have a lot of devices on the list. This was March of last year. I asked for an updated one, but I didn't get it in time. So we're at 800, and I'm guessing now we're probably close to 1,000. We're probably close to 1,000 devices that we have out there with stickers on them. And they vary from core routers to home routers to webcams to mobile phones to PCs, but go check out the list. There's a huge list of devices that have done this testing. As you can see, oddly enough, this is a really something you need to be asking the people you're working with. You'll see we have about 68 IPsec logos. The scary one is we have 14 DHCP logos. That's it for V6. If you're deploying V6 DHCP in your network, you'd better start asking people if they do it. We've, we've heard some, I've heard some horror stories about people who go to turn on DHCP and find out that half of their systems don't support it in any way, shape, or form. Right? Um, V6 by default doesn't have to support it, and there's a lot of implementations out there that do not do it properly. So it's a question you need to be asking if you, most of us as network operators like DHCP, um, it's a problem if it doesn't do it. So this is a, the startling stat with this one. I don't know why it is. I think sometimes people just haven't tried it. They assume it's like V4 and it'll just work. And I urge you, the DHCP V6 implementations are nothing like the V4 ones. There will be problems and you're, you're going to want to look at them. Um, I talked about this a little bit. Go to this link and you can see the World V6 participant launches for the home routers. Also. You know, for website manufacturers, all of that stuff. Go check these out yourselves. They're getting updated on a regular basis, so check back. You know, every once in a while. Um, USG test program. This is one you guys can use um, to leverage. Basically, this is a program the U.S. government does to buy equipment. Um, you have to go to an accredited lab to do the testing. It's a little bit different than the other two programs. The other two programs allow vendors to self-test. This one, you have to go to a lab. Um, you can leverage it though, it's basically what the, pro what the profile deals down to is a bunch of RFCs. If there's things that you want to have in your network, you can ask vendors to provide the same information that they provide to the US government. Most of them have to do it anyway, so you're not making any more work for them, they have this document sitting somewhere. Um, looking ahead, V6 things we're looking at in the future. Um, you know, I talked about get, we can get to the home now. We're starting to work to get into the home. So doing more stuff to make home networking work, like televisions, NAS is um, more home routers, multi-home routers, which leads us to smart objects, low power devices. So you're talking turning V6 on in your thermostat, on your power meter, all of those things need V6. The, you know, when we went to V6, the big thing was we had all these addresses, we could put IP everywhere. And so V6 is starting to move into outside of the core infrastructure, starting to get into smart objects. Um, the other with V6, obviously looking ahead where end-to-end -end applications are obviously a key part of this. End-to-end um, -end security is another thing. We, the IETF you know, talked about its pervasive monitoring. End-to-end -end security is obviously part of that, and V6 nicely lends itself to that problem. So um, these are all things V6 moving forward, things that we're going to continue to test um, or look into. Um, a little bit about what I do, the IOL. Um, we're, we, I come out of a university, um, University of New Hampshire in Durham, New Hampshire. Um, we're a third-party test facility, and really we came out of the research department. Um, we do this testing to help companies interop with one another um, in a neutral environment. Um, we ha test about 20 different technologies. Today I'm talking about V6. Just to give you guys an example, I have about 30 undergraduate students who work for me, and they've all already been hired, the ones that can be, so don't. <laughs> they're, they're all out there. They're always gone by the time. Most of them have jobs by, if they graduate in May, they've been hired by February. They're V6 experts. <laughs> Um, that are few and far between. <laughs> so um, we, we basically work with undergraduate students to help them learn technologies, learn how to test them, and then we, we 
teach them how to be professional engineers, working with customers, working with things. Um, our mission statement is really to help the industry, but also create student engineers. Questions? Oh, lots of hands. All right. So, uh, Jim Galvin with Phileas. Um, so, Interoperability Lab, I realize this is not an IPv6 question, but I, I can't resist. Yep. So, you're going to do uh, DNSSEC testing? I, I knew you were going to do this. We've, we've actually, we haven't set up a DNS testing program. I have done an interop for people when they've asked for it. Um, interestingly enough, we deal a lot with the manufacturers, and we haven't heard a whole lot about this, but I, won't, I will say there's a good possibility. We work really closely with NIST and other organizations. I wouldn't be surprised if we started a DNS consortium around that. Um, I will say I haven't heard of a ton of interoperability issues, which is probably why we haven't seen a ton of requests, but I, that, that's a good sign for DNSSEC, right? I mean, the first, um, when I get called about a technology, it usually means that devices from two different manufacturers, when you plug them in, fail miserably, and we help facilitate <laughs> everybody working together to, to fix the problem. So it's a possibility for sure. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name's Evan Leibovich. I'm uh, with ISOC Canada. A couple of questions. Uh, first of which is, uh, when I've been going out and trying to explain IPv6 at a grassroots level, the pushback that comes back is sort of, well, is there anything that I can't do with, with IPv6 that I can already do with, well, they don't say carrier grade NAT, but that's what they're using right now. Yeah. And so the impetus to change seems to be really difficult if the status quo serves the purpose that most people need. So. What can you say in terms of compelling reasons, at least to explain at an end user level, why people would want IPv6, if there's security issues, if there's other things to do with that? Do you foresee having this tipping point of having some website coming and saying, this is really good content, but it's IPv6 only, so you're going to need to have that in order to get that content? And my last question was a little more technical, and that is, do you know if any of the uh, open WRT or these flashable things for, for routers, if they're capable? Thanks. All right, so I'll, I'll answer the last question first because it's the easiest one, and the answer is yes. There's lots of open source V6 home routers out in the industry. There's, um, there's a new ISC initiative around this called um, Home Gateway. There's um, open WRT. There's a couple of open source packages for home routers, so for sure. Um, for CGN versus V6, this is actually, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of studies on this, and the main problem that people are running into when they deploy carrier grade NATs is applications. Um, every time a new application becomes available and uses a lot of ports, right, they have to, the carrier grade NAT has to design a, a solution, right? It's an extra box in your network now that you have to, every time a new application gets rolled out, whether it's, in this case, if it's over the top sometimes, right? You as an ISP have zero control over Netflix or whoever it might be, right? That if the user is using those types of technologies over your network, your carrier grade NAT is gonna have to have a solution for that. If, if they don't have one right off the bat, your users are gonna have a bad experience and they don't call Netflix, they call you, right? They call the ISPs and that's the real, bad case for a carrier grade NAT, is that applications as they deploy, if the carrier grade NAT can't deal with the connection, you know, if it's using a lot of ports and has to do some hair pinning or some other issues, there, there's been, you know, Xbox had a study on carrier grade NATs around peer-to-peer -peer that was a big issue for them. So peer-to-peer -peer gaming was really hard through the carrier grade NAT. Now they've solved that, but this is what happens. Every time an app comes out, it takes time for people to solve the issue instead of just moving to V6. Um, also from an operational standpoint, it's another box you have to keep in your network. You have to keep it up. Like it, it's just adding more complexity to your network where it's not needed. From an end user perspective, it, it, there's two things I say here. One is you're constantly gonna be fighting with your carrier grade NAT for every app. And then the second thing is it's, it's, more, it's more operational expense. Do I, okay, so the question was for the, the audience is, is, did I see any killer killer app for V6? There's, there's always people coming up with great ideas. I think the real thing here is end to end, right? As we get, as people come up with more stuff on their phone or whatever it might be, yes. I, do I actually know what it is? No, I'd be very, very rich if I knew what the killer app was. 
Um, no, I, I have no idea what it is, but I, I think it's honestly the model more than it is the actual app. It's, you know, it's going from end to end and not having to have all this infrastructure in between to make it work. Uh, around the end user question, are there any real efforts to focus on the education of the security challenges with IPv6? For example, a lot of SMB or residential customers, wrongly, but they still do, rely upon NAT as a really bad form of security. Yeah. The minute you go to a V6 world, and we talk about them as V6 routers because that's what they are, your PCs now, instead of being behind this false sense of security that is NAT, are now directly routable too. And a lot of the routers that are out there today don't actually provide V6 firewalls unless you buy higher end. Like a lot of the dealing lower end stuff won't do a V6 firewall. So you have to really convince the user, though, the point of doing oh, no. SPI and stuff, which, I mean, do we, do we really expect SMB customers and users to do that? Or, or okay. like, I guess, how are we going to educate them in that? All right, so there's a couple things. I talked about the V6 Ready test program. That has firewall requirements in it. So if they're not on that list, I guess that's possible. I mean, I work really closely with a lot of these guys. And you know, that's, that's changing right now, um, putting those firewalls in place that can protect the network. Um, obviously, there's, the other thing here is there's always new attacks So from a security perspective. Um, yes, I'm aware that people think NATs keep them safe. And it, th those boxes still had firewalls in them. And the V6 home routers will too. Right? As they get deployed, they will have the same level of security. Those home router guys do not want to get put on the front of a magazine saying that they have a bug that you can get into their box. Now, it still happens. My answer to this is it still happens in V4. Right? There are still bugs that come out where they have back doors, and you still have the same issues. I don't think it's actually that different than V4 today um, for, from the NAT perspective. Those V6 guys are, are very, those home routers try to be very cautious about. Honestly, they shoot more than they should. Right? Those firewalls kill more connections, probably sometimes good ones. Right? In the case of you know, Path MTU and some other things, they'll shoot down good stuff, um, which isn't, while it's not great for the end user, it's probably better from a security standpoint that they shoot things they don't recognize, right? And so sometimes that's a bigger issue. We've all had that in v we've all had that issue with v4 where your NAT's destroying your app, right? And you ha as a gamer, you have to log in and change the port so that it works, right? So I, yeah, it's it's the answer to that is I think it'll be the same. I think you'll have parity, right? I think you'll have parity with the v4 stuff and the v6 stuff um, outside of NAT, regardless of NAT. I think the security will be the same. Um, I have two questions for you. Yep. Um, a couple of years ago, we were told that China had run out of IPv4 um, and that they were going to go IPv6 in a big way. Um, yep. How come they're not green? And how do you explain um, the difference between Canada and the US and Canada and Australia? Canada Australia should normally be roughly the same. How come we're so far behind? Is there any reason for that? So, yeah. So I'll answer the first question first. We, we mentioned carrier-grade NATs. A lot of ISPs cannot or have run out of V4 addresses, and they, can't, they do not have enough V6 equipment available to them to buy today. So they have to put a carrier-grade NAT in. So for areas that have run out of V4 addresses, they've got to be doing something to make that work. Um, if you talk to a lot of the operators, they realize carrier-grade NATs are a Band-Aid, not the solution. So they're trying to get V6 as fast as they can because it's extra capex for them. So in any of these countries' case, not just China's, right, when, you, when your area runs out of V4 addresses and you have new users, whether it's mobile, you know, whatever it is you're doing, you're out of addresses. You've got to do something, right? And from an ISP perspective, you have two choices. You can deploy a carrier-grade NAT or you can try to roll out V6 faster, right? Now... Um, to answer your other question, you know, why is the U.S. so hard ahead of Australia and Canada? I think some of this is, you know, there's some ISPs that have done a lot of very good work in the U.S. to roll out V6. Um, some of them, like AT&T on this list, did it through a transition mechanism called 6RD. It's not native V6, but it still gets you V6. Um, Comcast is all native, right, in the U.S. Both of those are very large providers that give out a lot of Internet, which is how they get... That, that's basically how the U.S. is ahead. They have very two large infrastructures. Also, Verizon Wireless is a mobile provider, ups that number, right? So, I mean, th that's the answer. It's, it's getting provided to people's homes in the U.S., which is why its adoption is so much higher. Okay. Uh, uh, last question. Um, for a home uh, gateway, uh, let's say I have a big TV that's IPv4 only, mm. uh, and I'm not going to change it because I just bought it last year. Yeah. Um, if I get a router, should, should I get an IPv6 address and have the router basically do 6 to, six to 4 support for my TV, or uh, should it be both stacks at the same time? Uh, all right. So, uh, you know, most home, networks, uh, most home networks will be 
will be dual stack, so they'll have both. Um, someday in the future, operators, and I think this is coming faster than people realize, will only give out v6 addresses for the reasons that I previously mentioned. Basically, we're going to run out of v4. They don't want to keep a carrier grade NAT on. You're going to get v6 only. Um, your house is going to have to do something. There are different options in this space. Um, there's things like DS Lite. There's some other tunneling mechanisms where you can tunnel it basically out to the provider over v4. I don't expect your home gateway to actually be doing that translation. I, I mean, they can. I, I'd be surprised. I, I think that's probably going to happen somewhere else in the network. But um, there is some, you know, right now we're trying to get those TVs to start to turn on v6 because this is going to be a problem, right? There's going to be these legacy issues where things in your house need to some support of v4. Um, I think that's natural. I, I often make the analogy, this is like when you need your Wi-Fi to be faster, so you just go buy the newest thing. I think some of that's just going to happen naturally. You're going to want to go get Wi-Fi at gigabit speed for your TV so that you can get your HD streamed wirelessly so there's no wires. When you do that, you're going to get V6 with it too. I think it'll just come into natural product rollouts as, as the home evolves, I think, is what's going to happen. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, Ronald Greer from Fresno and Sullivan. I just saw the map. I didn't see Croatia in there, but uh, you know, the Deutsche Telekom has that uh, Terra uh, Stream uh, project going on with IPv6 over there, and I know they're uh, trying to do avant-garde work, not just on IPv6, but also on SDN, using TLF and Cisco. Uh, I was just wondering if there is a possibility that you guys might consider doing as part of your testing, because I remember you from a oh, previous no. life, uh, IMS, back in a decade oh. ago, okay. when you are doing a lot of IMS interop. If yep. you could somehow marry, uh, marry the two, SDN, Software Defined Networking, and IPv6, and bring some of that testing in because uh, you know I've been talking to the ONF and yeah you know I know they, they talk a little bit about that but they, they, they have some of the events but it's not quite I've seen what you guys done with IMS and I thought wow if you could do something like that for SDN and maybe also marrying that with IPv6 you know like TerraStream. Yep. So um, Thank you. we've just become an ONF test lab and I think some of that is around what you just. <laughs> Mentioned we have a long experience with v6 right and ONF added in 1.3 the support for v6 Yes, I absolutely think the lab will be doing as an organization people have come to us for interop between controllers and switches at a bare minimum Right is a lot of people have controllers or home devices. We've started to do some studies around NFV Right, we've had some ISPs come to us and say can you figure out what great things we can use with NFE, such as virtualizing different functionalities, using SDN to control end-to-end, -end, right? I mean, the real upside here from an ISP perspective is you have a controller and you can control both ends, especially for peer-to-peer -peer traffic. It's kind of cool. So from a research perspective, yes. You know, working at a university, I have lots of graduate students who are looking for theses. So we've been doing some work in that space. Um, and yes, I, I envision us continuing to work in that space. It seems to obviously SDN is a hot topic, so. I was going to say I see NFE as a use case of SDN, you know, really, but yeah, yeah, yeah. no, but uh, okay, thanks. All right, looking good. <laughs> Last call. All right, thank you, everybody. <laughs>